Before we jump into today's episode, let's hear from today's sponsor. Honest stories of pregnancy, parenthood, and loss are too often left unshared. We are here to tell the real stories. Join mom, actress, and advocate Tatiana Ali to hear real stories about the joys and humor of parenting to the heartbreak and loneliness of miscarriage and loss in a new podcast from the March of Dimes. Each episode features a parent's honest story about the realities of starting a family. It only takes hearing one story like your own to know you are not alone. To join the conversation, go to unspokenstories.org and marchofdimes.org. Let's get on to today's show. You're listening to the Sisters in Loss podcast, a faith-based grief and loss podcast for Black women, where you will hear stories of miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, and infertility to learn there is a testimony in tragedy. You will learn how to heal, gain clarity, find hope and peace, and turn your pain into your purpose after loss. I'm your host, Erica M. McAfee. Welcome to episode 109 of the Sisters in Loss podcast. Have you ever suffered from painful periods? Today's guest, Bria Burrell, has always had painful periods. And in 2015, she found out there was a cyst on her left ovary. Her OBGYN monitored the cyst for a couple months until it started to grow. In order to prevent the cyst from rupturing, the OBGYN performed a laparoscopic procedure in January of 2016. The cyst dominated the left part of Bria's pelvic cavity and therefore she had to have her left ovary and her left fallopian to remove. And during this procedure, it was determined she had endometriosis. She had many complications from that surgery that left her hospitalized for three weeks and her left bowel was perforated, resulting in her wearing a temporary colostomy bag. Bria takes us on the next steps of her journey to motherhood in this podcast episode where she undergoes fertility treatments, two rounds of IVF that resulted in two miscarriages and her next steps on her journey to parenthood. This episode is for you to listen to if you have ever been diagnosed with endometriosis or have lost a fallopian tube or ovary. Here is Bria Ruel. Thank you, Bria, for being on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for allowing me to be on the podcast. (laughs) No problem. I like to begin our episodes with you just sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay. I am a registered nurse. This is like, I call it my second career. (laughs) I didn't become a nurse until about two and a half years ago. I started off on like a medical surgical floor, like a general floor in a local like big teaching hospital here in DC. And a couple of months ago, I became a labor delivery nurse. So I'm, Growing my passion for like maternal health and like this big crisis with especially black women dying during childbirth. I'm really learning more about that and wanting to contribute to fixing the problem. So that's what I, that's my, my calling, I believe. And in the midst of becoming a, before I became a nurse, my husband and I started to try to have a baby. We had been married for a couple of years. So we tried very kind of casually and we were, we were, it was taking us a while, but then I got sick and noticed that before, not really sick. I just noticed that I had a, a lump on my like lower abdomen and it turned out to be a ovarian cyst, which we watched for a couple of months until it grew and I had to get it removed. So we were told then, oh, you know, this is, you have endometri- endometriosis and that's what's preventing you guys from getting pregnant. But with this cyst being removed, you should be able to have kids without complications. Well, from that surgery, uh, there was a complication during their procedure and my intestines or bowels were nicked. So I had to go back into the hospital and try to get my bowels repaired, which was a difficult process because they could not find, find where they perforated my bowels. So that meant I had to have a colostomy bag for a few months for my bowel to heal on its own. So that was a challenging experience for my husband and I. And then 
after I was healed, I went back to my surgeon who initially removed, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. In the process of having that cyst removed, it was dominating part of my pelvic cavity, the left side. So I ended up having my left ovary and fallopian tube removed. But again, I was told, you should be fine trying to conceive with just one tube and one ovary. So fast forward after I finally healed, got the colostomy bag removed, I returned to that surgeon just for a follow-up because I was going to definitely switch OBs after all that. And she was said, she said, oh, your right tube might be blocked. And that was definitely a surprise. And then she referred us to a fertility specialist. So from there, we did the, the general like fertility testing, like checking my hormone levels, the patency of my remaining tube, looking at my uterus. My husband did the sperm analysis. And it was determined that my right tube was also blocked. But my ovaries and hormone levels, those were fine. We just need to do, use IVF to get pregnant. So that process has been consuming our lives for the last three years, three to four years. Wow. So let's back up. You said that they nicked your bowels during the surgery and then you weren't able, they weren't able to find it when they went back in. So no. you had to get clap me bag for a few months. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, that was was that. That was definitely challenging. And at that point, I had finished nursing school, but was looking for a job. So I hadn't worked in the hospital officially yet. But my nursing school knowledge definitely helped me along with that process. You're trying to figure out what's going on with me. And actually, after the initial, when they removed my cyst and the ovary and my fallopian tube, that was an in-and-out procedure. I went home, but I just didn't feel right. And I kept calling them, the nurses and the doctors saying, you know, something's not right. And they were like, you know, this is typical. You just, you know, it takes a few days to get back to yourself. And maybe four or five days after the procedure, I was taking a shower and I felt really dizzy. And I called my husband into the bathroom and I fainted. And I was like, you know what, that's God trying to tell me something. I need to go back to the hospital. Like something is not right. Because when the ambulance arrived, we did call 911. The ambulance arrived and they were like, no, you, you know, your vitals are stable. Your sugar level is fine. Like, you you seem okay. And I was like, no, maybe this is God nudging me saying so something's not right. So I go to a hospital that, well, that was closer to our house. And they do run some tests. And they're like, no, you have a bunch of gas and fluid in your abdomen that shouldn't be there. You probably have, like, uh, some type of bowel perforation. So they had to open me up. And then they, they looked for the, the, the perforation but couldn't find it. And that's when they recommended it. So, you know what, you need to have a colostomy bag. Because if not, like, you will continue to have, like, fluid that belongs in your intestines will come into your abdomen, which was already starting to make me sick because I had to be on antibiotics. Like, I was basically septic. So that's why I spent almost three weeks, oh, three weeks in the hospital. And then they sent me home with a colostomy bag because that can be taken care of, you know, at home. I mean, a lot of people have to function with one. People usually get them, like, after, if like, you have colon cancer and they remove part of your colon, or if we have diverticulitis. So I just had to learn how to use it. I use YouTube a lot. <laughs> Cause I feel like at the hospital, they, they showed me what to do, but I didn't know like how to live with a colostomy bag. I was embarrassed. I thought if I walked outside, people would be able to tell what was going on with me. So that was definitely an adjustment. And then thankfully, I had a job that allowed me to work from home. So that helped out at that time as well. So at that point, I was about to ask you, how did you, how yeah. did you go to work and really function during those few months as your bowels were starting to heal? Really, as you were healing from the inside yeah. out, you know, you're all yeah. that was healing, not just your bowels, your intestines, your stomach, you know, healing from removing your fallopian tube and your ovary, like all of yeah. that healing, you know? And I think at that time, I didn't have time to process that I only had one ovary, one fallopian tube because I was like, other things to start to happen. It, it was definitely a challenging moment. But by the grace of God, like, my husband and I, we got through it. So during that time, was that, like, a complication that they that they told you that could happen from so, your cyst removed or your fallopian tube? Well, you didn't know you were going to have to get your fallopian tube removed, but you knew that the ovary, the ovary and the cyst may have had to come because of how big the cyst was. Yeah, so she took, before the surgery, my my doctor said, you know, my initial goal is to go in and t- just take the sit. But it's, it's looking like it's really large. And if it's like too big and it may cut off the blood supply to your ovary, which is a whole nother issue, we will definitely take your ovary and your fallopian. It depends on, you know, how things go. So I, I consented to that. 
and the complications with my bowels, like for any general, like when they do abdominal surgery, that's just a general complication. People ask me, oh, you should sue. And like, that was the first thing that came to my mind. But like, I signed a consent saying, I know the risks associated with this surgery and it sucks, but you know, it happened. And actually when I started working as a nurse, I came into contact with a couple of women who had similar stories as me. It happened. No, oh, it definitely does. And I'm, I have, I don't have the same story as you as far as having to go back into the hospital. But I have dealt with, since I had an emergency hysterectomy, I have dealt mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. female bowel colon issues since yeah. I had a hysterectomy. And that's been, mm-hmm. you know, that was four years ago. So almost five years ago now. So I definitely, any abdominal surgery that, even just a basic C-section, you do, you still are yeah. at that risk for um, getting your bowels or even your bladder perforated, basically, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I just just wanted to ask that question because I know a lot of people are probably going to think about it as as we are talking. So after you you know you've gone back, you've had you had the colostomy bag, you got the colostomy bag removed. When was the time that you actually sat and actually sat with the fact that you only had one ovary and one fallopian tube? I think when I went back to the my OBGYN, the one who did the initial surgery, just to kind of wrap things up and get. Like, have a true follow-up. But I never had the opportunity because I was, you know, I got sick so fast. And I was, I remember being in the uh, exam room and I was just bawling and crying. Like, it just, it, I think it just hit me. Then when she told me, oh, your remaining tube is maybe blocked. I was like, I felt like, I was like, oh, I'm really broken. Like, I can't, this is too much to deal with. And even I remember the ride home, I was crying and I got home. And my husband wasn't home yet, but when he got home, I think when immediately when I saw him, I just started crying. He's like, what is wrong? And I couldn't even get the words out to say, like, what she said, you know, during our appointment. And to him, he was like, okay, you know, like, we can deal with this. But, you know, to me, it's like, you know, this is the one, one of the things I should be able to do with a woman. And now we need help. And, you know, and his whole thing was like, well, she didn't say you can. She just said we might need help. I'm like, yeah, but still. Like, but I just think it was, everything was hitting me at once, like, you know, I don't have two ovaries and you can be successful with having a baby with one ovary. I do know that, but I think it was just hitting me that, oh, I only had one ovary, you know, now I might use IVF, another thing to, you know, another mountain to overcome. So, Yeah. So yeah. take us on that journey when you and your husband decided to go through the IVF process. So my, I, I actually, someone I knew from nursing school was, a surrogate after her and her husband had I think after they had three children together she decided to be a surrogate at least twice so I knew she knew a lot about the you know using you know using help to get pregnant so I reached out to her and she told me to try Shady Grove which is pretty big in the DC area so we just signed up for a consultation and we went in and my doctor he seemed very hopeful for us he was like you know I, at this point I think I was 34 and to me, I'm feeling like I'm getting old. Like this, I'm like I need to get things rolling. But he's like, no, you're, you know, you have time. Like things are fine. He's like, you know, we'll go through the initial testing and see where we are. And so, you know, don't jump to any conclusions yet. So then we did like I did the they they draw blood and look at your uterus at certain points during your cycle. Then you do I think it's called the H. I forgot the name of it exactly. But they look at the patency of your tube. And that's when they said, yep, you definitely have a block two. So the issue of having a block two, and he said, you know, he can't tell me exactly why, but he, he he's thinking of the endometriosis plus me having a couple of those abdominal surgeries might have added scar tissue to my tube. And that why that's why it wasn't peaking. So then he was like, okay, we can work with that. You just need to do IVF. But because you have a block two, if you get pregnant, you have the risk of fluid like backflowing from your uterus. How did he describe it? With back, fluid backflowing into your uterus to affect your pregnancy, which could be dangerous as well. He's like, so I know you don't want, you know, I know you don't want to have any more surgery, but there's a procedure you can do to permanently block off that tube. So if when you do, this is very positive, when you do get pregnant, there's no risk of that pregnancy being affected due to my tube not being patent. That makes so that kind of delayed us again. I had a procedure called, I put, they put a e-shore into my tube, which is a whole nother issue. So that's no longer being used. <laughs> but at that time it was like totally fine through FDA. 
So that uh, some women, most women who get it, they use it to block their tube so you won't get pregnant again. Like after you decide that you, you have your family. But a lot of women in the infertility like community, if you have a blocked tube, they get this procedure as well to permanently block your tube so that, you know, your pregnancy is not at risk for, from backflow through your tube. So we did that. And then we had to wait another three months before we could actually start IVF because we had to make sure that the tube, were, that my right tube was permanently blocked and there, there could be no backflow. So that put us into, let's see, I initially had my first, like had my ovary removed in December of 2015. Then I had all those other surgeries in January of 2016. Went to see the fertility specialist probably toward the fall of 2016. And then had this last, this other procedure, the East Shore procedure in January of 2017. Then officially started IVF in May of 2017. And we were pretty, we were hopeful going into the IVF. I was like, you know what, this is, you know, I think it was like a guaranteed way of getting pregnant. I thought, you know, I was like, you know what, this is our time. We're going to, I'm going to be praying and hopeful. And, you know, this is how we, this is how we get our baby. And I think we got, I think initially I had 10 eggs after the egg stimulation. And then they fertilized them all with my husband's sperm. And I think we had seven that after like the first few days. But when it got time to do a transfer, there were only two left. But they always say, you just need one. So we transferred, we did a fresh transfer of one embryo. And two weeks later, negative pregnancy test, which was shocking because I, you know, I was like, this is, you know, this is my guaranteed way of getting pregnant. So I was like, you know what? In God's time, we still have another embryo left. We will take a little break and come back and visit this. You know, we'll, we're going to have our miracle baby. So then we waited a few months and then we transferred the, our remaining embryo. And then we had a chemical pregnancy. So after two weeks, they called us. They were like, you know, your HCG level is very low, but it's above, you know, it's technically a positive. So, you know, continue taking your medicines and call, you know, come back in a few days, we take the test and, you know, hopefully things are moving along as you want them to. But then a few days later, it was zero. So they just say, oh, a chemical pregnancy. So that was definitely heartbreaking because we had no more embryos left, which meant I had to do the whole egg stimulation over again, which was, which can be a lot on your body. And with my, so at this point I was working as a nurse and with the you know, during the whole prepping for the egg retrieval and there's a lot of appointments you have to go to. And it was a bit challenging for my schedule. Cause you know, for me, I work these three days a week, but they're 12 hour shifts. And when I'm at work, I can't like be late or I can't leave early. Like I am there for 12 hours. And on the days that, you know, to do the blood work and the, like the ultrasound testing, our fertility clinic, test from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And the one of the facilities is close to my house, but I have to be at work by 7, and I have like a 45-minute ride to work. So that, you know, for days I'm working, it doesn't, not the easiest. And at that point, I wasn't really telling people at my job what I was, what I was going through. But as things progressed, I needed, you know, some, some flexibility with my schedule. I did mention it to my manager. I was like, you know what, I'm going through IVF. And, you know, I may need some flexibility with, like, kind of switching my schedule around. And they were perfectly fine with that. Like, all my, I don't know why I was worried. <laughs> but they were perfectly okay with that. So then I started the second round of IVF. And my fertility doctor decided to switch things up a little bit because he said, although, you know, we had these seven embryos and only two made it to, like, day five or six. He's like, that's a bit alarming. So we'll just switch up your drug protocol, which we did. And he was right. Like, I think I may have had 15 eggs, which was a lot, especially only had one ovary and maybe 10 fertilized and seven made it to like day five or six. So that was a big difference from the other, from the previous cycle when we only had two. So after this, this brings us to, I guess, December of 2017, when I started the second IVF cycle. And from there, we transferred immediately and Again, two day, two weeks later, negative pregnancy test. But you know, we're feeling hopeful. We're like, okay, we still have six eggs, six embryos frozen. Like, you know, we're just going to push through. 
So we decided, you know, we're going to do one more, like take a little bit like a month break and then go right back into it and see what happens. And then we finally got a positive. And this was, so we transferred, did a frozen transfer in February of 2018. And then we got a positive March 1st or March 2nd, 2018. And, you know, they have you come back and test every few days for about a week or so. And we, our HCG, HCG levels kept rising, so very promising. And we went in for the six-week checkup. We had a heartbeat, like, oh, my God, like, this is really happening. So we were kind of starting to slowly tell people, a little apprehensive, but, you know, we were very, very, very excited. And then we went in for the eight-week checkup, which should have been our last appointment with the fertility clinic but we did not have a heartbeat. So that was extremely devastating. Like, did not expect that at all. Like, I was believing in my miracle baby. And my doctor was like, you know, I know this is like the worst thing, but, you know, take a positive from this experience. You were able to get pregnant. And I was like, you know what? You were absolutely right. So I've been, you know, I hung on to that. Like, you know what? This sucks. Everything we've been through, but, you know, I did get pregnant. And that. At that point, before we got the positive, I was starting to wonder, like, maybe something's wrong with my uterus. Like, maybe I cannot get pregnant. Like, that was something that was starting to cross my mind as well. So then, after the miscarriage, I didn't really have any bleeding. Like, I had no, I didn't walk into the office expecting not to see a heartbeat again. So, my doctor was like, we can do a DNC, and then I can test the tissue to see what happened. He was like, you know, two of things, you know, one of two things could have happened. There was some type of chromosomal abnormality and your body did what it should have done. And this happened. You know, no, you, you can't we really, can't explain it, but this is what happened. Or there was nothing wrong and you had a miscarriage. And then that's a whole nother story. Like we, we'll cross that bridge and we get there. So I ended up having a DNC and they test the tissue and it comes back that there was an extra chromosome. So, you know, still heartbreaking to know. And then, like, also, when they're testing the chromosomes, they can also figure out, you know, if it was a male or female, and it came back that it was a male. Like, it, that really made things real for my husband and I. So we decided after that, we decided, you know what, we, we'll take away that we did get a positive, And, you know, that we did get a positive, we got pregnant, and that's a huge blessing. But I needed to take a break for a second. Like, it, it was emotionally, it was becoming a lot so during this point I also was in the midst of transitioning job and it had been my dream to become a labor and delivery nurse but I kept saying to myself this is not the right time like I'm struggling myself to become a mom how can I help other women bring life into this world but you know God laughed at our plans and I ended up interviewing and getting the job so I was like you know what I don't know how to do this but I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing so I'm going to go with it so then I ended up, I switched units at my at the hospital, started working as a labor delivery nurse, was loving it, and then I decided, okay, you know what, we can this is it's time to try again. At this point, we were faced with the decision of do we want to test our remaining embryos, see if they if they are any abnormalities because can I you know can we go through with having another miscarriage? Like you know, we were thinking of all those questions. But I was told that even if we do test our embryos, there's no guarantee that you won't have another miscarriage. Plus, although thankfully our insurance covered, we, our, my husband's insurance with his job covered the IVF for us, but this extra additional testing would have been straight out of pocket. So we thought about it, prayed about it, and said, you know what, we're going to go with another transfer and see what happens. So in September of 2018, we transferred another embryo. And in Following two weeks from that point, we got a positive. And I was like, okay, like we're we're making progress. This is it. Very like kind of fearful, like, okay, we've been here before though. But I was like, you know, I'm gonna have faith. Gotta have faith, push through. And for the first I think for two weeks, yeah, we got we got two more like promising eight rises in our H C G level. And then a third test, we got a it rose but not enough. Like it didn't double like it should have. My doctor was like, that's a bit concerning, but we're going to hold off, you know, just come back in two more days and then come back for all this time. Because at that point, I think we would have been at the six week mark. We go in and there's nothing in my uterus, like nothing, like, like, okay. 
And then I, I did blood work and my ACG level, it was dropping at this point. But it was a bit confusing because it was like, well, I got, I had rises. Like I was pregnant, but my doctor was like, it might have just been a chemical pregnancy. I guess you that classified as a chemical pregnancy versus a miscarriage because there was they didn't see a stack in my uterus. So again, just extremely devastated. I remember having I was on or I was still new to my the labor and delivery unit, so I was on orientation. I remember having to go to work the next day, and in retrospect, I probably should have called out like learning that you had a miscarriage or chemical pregnancy, and then going to work to help people deliver babies was not the best idea. But I wanted, you know, I'm like, I'm new to this unit. I'm still in orientation. I need to put my best foot forward. So I went to work and that was a horrible day, but I pressed through. So then we decided, you know, what? again, we need an emotional break from this whole process. So we have four embryos left. We thought about, so we had to revisit the idea of do we test them? Do we not test them? And my doctor was like, you know, I don't. Either or is the option. Like, I don't really think, you know, whatever's best for you, like financially, like he's not giving us a, the, the red light to, I mean, the green light to just do one or to test or, you know, versus not testing. And I talked to a few couples who did the process, who did test their embryos and it didn't really do anything for them. Like, so I think we're leaning toward the direction of not testing. And also I was reading some more about it. It's, I think it works best when you go from a fresh, we have a fresh batch of embryos, you test them and then you freeze them as opposed to freezing them, having them unfrozen and then freezing them again. Because when you, the unfreezing and freezing again can compromise the embryo. So that is my fertility journey that I'm still embarking upon. <laughs> Today's podcast episode is sponsored by the March of Dimes. There is no perfect pregnancy, birth, or parent, and yet we rarely hear the real stories. It's time we speak up. Mom, actress, and advocate Tatiana Ali hosts Unspoken Stories, a new podcast from March of Dimes featuring real stories from the joys of parenthood to what happens when things don't go according to plan. You can listen to Unspoken Stories for free wherever you get your podcasts or by visiting unspokenstories.org. We see a lot of perfect images of pregnancy, birth, and parenting, but more and more people are standing up to tell their real stories. In this podcast, you will hear some of those real stories from the joy of parenting and the complexities of dealing with illness with actress and mom, Jamie Lynn Sigler, a mom coping with loss and raising two toddlers, to the realities of parenting a baby born prematurely. These brave moms and dads have the courage to speak up and share their laughter, tears, and triumphs so that no one has to feel alone in their experiences. Sisters in Loss, I hope that you will join this important conversation, whether you are a parent, or you're considering becoming one. Subscribe to Unspoken Stories for free wherever you get your podcasts and learn more by visiting unspokenstories.org. That's unspokenstories.org. So tell us really how you and your husband have been processing the disappointments after disappointments that you've had really since you started this journey, you know, when you found out your fallopian tubes were blocked and you had one removed and you had to permanently block the other one. And then, you know, the disappointment with the chemical pregnancies that you had, just really tell us how you both have grieved through this. I think we grieve differently, which kind of works for us. I lost my mom eight years ago, right before we got married. So I'm no, like, I'm no stranger to the grieving process. So I kind of know, like, after going through that, like, I kind of know what I need to do to get myself out of a rut. Like, when I lost my mom, I did see a therapist. So after, actually, before we even started the IVF, I decided, you know what, I need a therapist. I need someone I can talk to to work things out, to keep me positive and, you know, to try to process all this. So the therapist has helped for me praying a lot. That definitely helps keeping... And my husband, if I am glass half empty, he will be glass half full. And when he's feeling glass half empty, I'll be the glass half full perspective. And I've also 
I go to a, a ther- just I go to therapists myself, but uh, there's a group, a support group at our fertility clinic. So I also go to that for support. My husband, I invited him to go with me, but that's not really his thing. He's like, you know, if, if I go, and this is true, like it can be sad because people will share their stories and I'm in there tearing up myself. Cause, you know, you feel their pain. And he was like, you know, I want to continue to be positive. He's like, I feel like if I go to that, that's not really helping me with being positive. So I would rather not go to the support group at the fertility clinic, which was a little upsetting at first, but I, I respect his, you know, I, I see why, like, I get it. So that also helped me. And then also, like, I, I have, I know two people who have gone through IVF themselves. So talking to them, reaching out to those women, that's helped me as well. My husband, I mean, I think he can be like typical guy in this aspect. I don't think he really talks to his friends about anything, but he will, you know, talk to me about it. But outside of me, I don't really, you know, he's not saying much to anyone, but that seems to work for him. And also like taking breaks, that, that's been a good, that, that helps us. Like, you know, after we get this bad news, like we'll take a break, we'll do something like maybe go on like a, a quick trip to, you know, just be us and have fun again. And I have to think about, you know, taking shots or taking pills and running back and forth to the doctor's office to get blood work done. Like taking a break has definitely helped us. So what are you all doing now to prepare you for your next round of, I guess you're not going through the whole round of IVF, but you're actually, what do you do to prepare your body? I guess in my mind for you to actually get your embryo transferred and what are you doing? If you're doing anything differently now, what are you doing differently to prepare yourself for the next round? So because I am over 35 and I guess like a whole thing, you know, being over 35 years of maternal age, I'm trying to be as healthy as possible, which means like just, you know, working on my diet, trying to stay physically active. And also because of my job, like it can be very demanding. And I'm trying to get into a routine of like making sure I eat breakfast when I'm at work. I eat lunch. I'm snacking. I'm taking the appropriate break. Just trying to kind of get in that mindset. Of that because you know it's easy to go eight hours and be on your feet and not eat anything and barely drink any water which is so not the thing you should be doing but I realized as a pregnant person that's and that can't that can't fly anymore so you're just working on my diet we're trying to eat a healthy diet and exercising and also just staying in prayer you know of course like I'm praying for the best I'm praying that the, the next transfer that's our miracle baby but you know as his, as you know, the last few years have shown is like, you know, we prayed this prayer before and it didn't work out. But, you know, we're okay. Like we made it through and, you know, just believing in God's will. Just, you know, just trying to, you know, getting myself into that. And I'm in j- journaling too. This year I started a, a gratitude journal. So just try not to focus on the bad, just trying to, you know, be thankful and be in the moment and be present and realize the blessings that I do have. You know, because I can sit and talk for a while and about how it sucks that I can't have a baby naturally. And, you know, we've gone through all these types of losses. But, you know, like, we're still very, very, very blessed. Both my husband, like, we got off of his insurance and transferred to my insurance. And we still, like, the IVF is still, and the transfers, they are covered. That's a covered benefit. We still have the frozen embryos to use, you know, I did get pregnant before, you know, so just trying to focus on the blessings that we have. Yeah, for sure. So what other resources and tools? I know you mentioned a few groups that you're a part of that are local to you. Were there anything online or any books, any other podcasts, anything that you actually use to help you Um, as you're going throughout this journey? Yeah. So I will be up late at night can't sleep on Instagram, typing in hashtag TTC, hashtag IVF, and just looking at various posts of women who've been through similar situations and like being inspired by their stories. Do you want me to give you exact examples or? Yeah, anything that you feel would be useful for okay. the listeners that you want to share, you know, like I said, Instagram accounts, you know, any books, okay. any other websites that you go to frequently for inspiration that can help them as they're going through this journey because a lot of a lot of people may be in between too you know they may have had a failed IVF or 
they may have endometriosis and they're not really sure if they want to go down that IVF. You know, what other tools that you, you felt like have helped you push you to continue to have hope and hold on to that hope? So Shady Grove Fertility, they actually have the Instagram page and they're also their email list. They send out stories of couples that have been successful at their clinic. So the emails that they send, or you can just go to like go to their website and you can look on, I guess, that story or couples that want to share something. I think it says, or just maybe just stories or, yeah. You will see like a list of couples who have various conditions from PCOS, endometriosis, unexplained fertility, pre, uh, reoccurring loss, like who have detailed their story and like they've been successful. They have gotten their rainbow baby or their miracle baby. And their Instagram page also, like if, if a woman posts on her own personal page and decides to share, like they will repost that. And that's been very helpful to see like, you know, and you'll see the women who've been through multiple, like several IVF cycles and it's been going on for multiple years and they just keep pressing forward and they get their baby. There's another blog I follow. She's on Facebook and Instagram. And she has a blog called Waiting for Baby Bird. It's a Christian uh, blog too. She's very inspirational. She she might have I think she has PCOS and she ended up adopt she was they were fostering a child and ended up adopting that daughter, but they are still trying to conceive naturally. And she and her husband have decided that they did IVF once. They decided that that's not the thing for them anymore, which is perfectly fine. But she shares other stories of other couples. And she posts like inspirational messages. So that's been helpful as well for me. Your podcast is very helpful, very encouraging. There's another podcast I follow, Beat Infertility. That's another one. Heather and her podcast. Yeah. She does it. She tackles it from all angles too, even yeah. the male factor infertility. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. A lot of couples don't really talk about, especially in the black community, we don't really talk Absolutely. about the, we always think of infertility as a female issue, but really it's a mm-hmm. couple issue. You know, men could be the, the issue just as well as the woman. So I do love, that's a great resource and a great podcast. And she also, also has a lot of doctors and yes. fertility specialists and stuff on her show to talk more in detail on that technical knowledge. So if you are battling yes. infertility, Definitely go check out the infertility and then just search for whatever topic that you're looking for, whether it's, you know, you're battling endometriosis or you lost a fallopian tube or your ovary. She she goes into detail on that. And I was on one of her episodes. So I can't remember the number. <laughs> I share I share my infertility journey. OK, I actually listened to her. A, a doctor was on there talking about the PBS testing, about testing your embryos. So I was getting more information about the SD. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. So she, she always has some great experts on it. So there's another great resource that's out there. Any others you can think of? All the ones you listed are great, are awesome. There is another girl, I another woman I follow on Instagram, Nikki IVF Journey. That's one of them. N-I-K-K-I-S underscore I-B-F underscore journey. She posts a lot about wellness, too. Nice. Okay. That also plays a role with yeah. endometriosis and PCOS and mm-hmm. fibroids. You know, making sure that you're taking care of your the insides of your body as well as the outside. Yeah, so absolutely. That is, that is excellent. Excellent resources. So to round out the podcast, Keep us updated on where you are in your journey and we'll continue to follow you. But what encouraging words can you leave with the listeners of the mom that's out there who's experienced some losses and is going through this IVF journey, very similar to you? What encouraging words can you leave with her as she continues on this fight and to hold on to hope? They prayed up. I mean, you know, you never know who's going to hit you. And, you know, it's important. Like prayer has been the one of the main things to get me through this. But also just remember that one setback is not going to, not, it's not your final destination. You know, people have gone through this and they've had several setbacks, but they do end up having a baby. You know, it's possible. Like, you know, just try to stay focused on that. But in the meanwhile, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to take some time to yourself and, you know, just take a step back and, you know, 
when you take a step back, like do something good for you. Like, you know, focus, like go get a manicure, pedicure, or even take a trip. Try to maintain your well-being because it can be difficult. Like it's very, you know, it's, you'll find yourself like stuck in a rut and that can't be good for, you know, trying to get pregnant, you know. And it, in order to remain, remain positive and hopeful, it's best sometimes just to take a step back and take a break from things. And, that, you know, that's okay. You have to do that. Also, you know, it's it's okay to share your story. You know, a lot of, I do have friends who, you know, they don't struggle with infertility. They have been able to get pregnant, but they're very encouraging to me. And they may not know, understand everything that I'm going through, but it sometimes I'm able to vent to them. And, you know, they get it. They pray for me. They say encouraging words for me. And sometimes that helps just to talk about it. Like, don't keep it all bottled up in, like, and I know it feels like you may be the only person, but people do have, people go, through, you know, it's not, this is not uncommon. And being a L&D nurse, I see it, you know, like it's not easy for everyone to get pregnant. And, the, you know, the multiple miscarriages, like, you know, the endometriosis and the fibroid, but people are able to have babies. It, it You know, it happens like, you know, and part of the thing is, you know, as being an L&D nurse, like it's very it's very encouraging to me. So, and I, I encourage women to find that thing, you know, it's different for everyone that keeps you encouraged, you know, reach out. If it's, you know, journaling your story or, you know, there's several like self-help books out and just, you know, finding something that gives you peace and encourages you. Yeah, everyone should do that. Absolutely. I love the, the thought process on journaling. I think journaling would be is excellent to help you as you grieve and as you heal. So where can we find you on social to stay in contact with you? Because I know people are going to want to follow you as you go through your next round of IVF. Well, right now, it's just Mrs. Bria B. M-R-S-B-R-I-A-B. That's my Instagram. They're going to go follow Bria and Keep her encouraged and send her all the encouraging words as she continues to fight this fight. You know, I think we are all in different places in our journeys and it's always good to hear another sister share her story and share her light. So I thank you so much, Bria, for sharing with us your testimony. And we cannot wait and to see where your journey goes so we can you can come home with that rainbow baby and that mirror baby <laughs> that we know that God has promised you. Thank you for having this platform. Like this is very important. Like very like we need this definitely. And thank you for having me. Like I really appreciate this. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I pray that this show was inspirational and a blessing to you. For show notes, visit ericaandmcafee.com forward slash podcast. Please join us in our offline discussions in our private Facebook group by going to sistersinloss.com. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, please rate and subscribe to us and leave us a five-star review. I pray that you all have a blessed week. Keep the faith and I'll talk to you next Wednesday.